So today we'll um, talk more about working with text data, in particular um, LSA and topic models. So these are both um, unsupervised techniques and the motivation is that we want to get representations of our data that are more semantic than a distributed like a word representation that we talked about last time. So some of the limitations of vagal words um, that we already mentioned are that um, the semantics of words are not captured at all. So each word is just an independent feature. Um, so synonyms, for example, are not represented. And uh, we also have a very high dimensional, very distributed representation of documents. So we have a giant vector and most of the entries are zero. And this is maybe something that might be hard to understand. And today we'll start from the back of word representation, but we'll try uh, some ways to make the representation uh, more compact and maybe more semantic. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is latent semantic analysis or LSA. LSA is uh, basically just doing PCA. Only that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for sparse data, you can't really subtract the mean. So doing standard PCA, which requires subtracting the mean, is kind of tricky. Um, I say you can't subtract the mean. Um, you could actually still do the PCA and implicitly subtract the mean, but it's going to be a little bit more complicated to implement the PCA. Traditionally, what people are doing with LSA is just ignoring that there's a mean and just do a singular body decomposition of the data matrix X. So this, and then possibly uh, drop some of the uh, less significant singular values or singular components. So this gives you um, a dense representation with the hope that um, maybe this is uh, a little bit more semantic than the bike of word representation. Also, this is very easy to compute. This is a convex optimization problem. You just have to compute the singular value decomposition. It's very straightforward. In um, scikit-learn, you can easily do that with the uh, truncated SVD, which truncated SVD just does an SVD and then drops the least uh, significant components. So here, I um, do my back of work representation with the current vectorizer. I mentioned last time um, for unsupervised algorithms such as this, it might be important to drop the stop words. Otherwise, because stop words are very, very common, they might dominate uh, the whole representation. Um, so I remove the stop words and I set min df equal to four to get like this slightly smaller vocabulary. Um, this is again on the IMDB movie data set. So here I'm using the whole data set as we're doing like an unsupervised algorithm, unsupervised feature extraction. So we have 25,000 samples and uh, the vocabulary has size uh, 30,000. So here, extrain is the bag of word representation that we talked about last time. Now we can apply truncated SVD. I um, compute the first 100 components and then, um, as usual with the transformer, API, I call fit transform that fits the SVD, and then I get the transformed uh, representation, which is the projection on the singular, decom singular components. And the components here are now um, 100 times um, 30,000. So I have 100 components each of which is a vector in the 30,000 dimensional feature space of the bag of words. If I look at the shape of XLSA, XLSA now would be 25,000 times 100. So we compressed the data representation from a sparse uh, 30,000 uh, dimensional representation to a dense 100 dimensional representation. 
similar to what we did with PCA, we can look at the singular values or the explained variance ratio. And uh, you can see that a lot of the explained variance uh, is actually in the first two components. That's not super surprising. The first component basically models something like the mean usually, uh, because like pointing from zero to the mean is what explains the most uh, variance. Then after the second one, it drops off and uh, you can see actually there's like another drop off here, like around 10 somewhere. And then you have a pretty like heavy tail. Um, so the, the, even the hundreds component still explains a lot of the variance. And so we could get even a higher dimensional dense representation if we wanted to. In contrast to um, NMF, here we have the singular values, I mean, yeah, or you can order them easily uh, by magnitude. So if we know we can keep like the first two if we just don't want the main effects, or we can keep the first 10 if we want a little bit more, and so on. Here I visualize the first six eigenvectors of LSA. So obviously they have their, um, each of the eigenvectors is 30,000 dimensional. So we have 30,000 entries and um, they will all be non-zero in general, but I only show the most common ones. The first one, as I said, is, oh, sorry, I only show the most, uh, the biggest coefficients for each of the singular values. Um, the first one, as I said, is usually something like pointing towards the mean, and you can see this by all of them being positive. And um, I removed the stop words, but I didn't remove movie and film. And so movie and film are the uh, very, very common words in um, this data set, obviously. And uh, like and just and good, these are all very common words. And so the first com uh, component basically just captures what are the most common words in this corpus. What I find quite interesting is that the second component basically captures um, whether someone uses the word film or movie. So you see a negative film and films and a positive movie in movies. And these are like much bigger than all the other coefficients. So um, if you would just use the first component, you would have you would um, model. Well, you would have a model saying the, uh, each review contains both the word film and movie. But that's not actually true. For mo most reviews, the person will use either one of the words. Either they will say film and films, or they will see movie and movies. And so the second component that we found actually uh, describes that and basically says these these two are more or less. Um, mutually exclusive. Um, yeah, we can uh, look at the other components. Um, you, you can see that film and movie come up a lot, also like and ju uh, just, because these seem to be just like very uh, prominent words. I found it hard to understand like much, much else that's going on. So to remove the effect of um, mo movie and films and like and just dominating so much, um, one thing we can do is we can scale the data and so that everything is sort of on the same scale. So we have removed the effect of how common the words are overall. We could use, do this either using something like TF-IDF, which we talked about. Um, we could also try to normalize by the length of the of each of the reviews here i'm just um, rescaling with max f scalar this is very similar to standard scalar only it doesn't remove the mean so here it just takes it scales the maximum absolute value to be one so basically it rescales each column by the maximum times the word appears in in any review If I do that, uh, I get slightly more semantic components, maybe. Uh, the first one still something that is like probably explains the mean. The second one, which I think 
is interesting. It's um, m might actually be um, somewhat negative, really bad acting. I mean, maybe I'm. Inter uh, I mean, it could be positive or negative, but I think um, actually and really and don't are usually uh, have have more in the negative ones. Whereas these components here just actually uh, seems to relate more with positive, um, recommend, great, excellent, highly wonderful, and so on. Um, so that's kind of interesting that we found something that is um, actually quite semantic here. This component again here you can see that the negative ones are like loved, wonderful, recommend, and the positive ones uh, coefficients are um, bad, unfortunately looks. And so uh, this again might capture some of the um, uh, so some of the positive negative semantics. It's interesting because we just gave it um, a data set of movie reviews, right? This is a completely unsupervised method. So nothing in here said, oh, we're interested in positive and negative reviews. This is just something that it found by itself uh, from the data set. Um, I mean, the person that curated the data set removed all the more or less neutral um, reviews, so it might make sense that the remaining reviews are somewhat uh, polarizing. All right, um, we can maybe, uh, so here there's, uh, you can maybe look at this. Um, so here I'm taking the f first and the third component because uh, whenever I made this plot, I thought they, they seem to be very semantic. So I'm looking at this, this guy and this guy together because I felt like these were like pretty semantic. And you can see that in the CD projection actually, um, you have a lot of semantics of uh, this, um, of the labeling here. So you get this 2D scatter plot of the first two, um, no, sorry, not of the first two, but of the first and the third, um, or I should say the second and the fourth um, LSA component, and it's colored now by um, whether it's a positive or negative um, review, and you can see that there not perfectly separated, but actually there's like a lot of structure in this. So one might claim that this actually found some very discriminative structure in the data in a completely unsupervised way. Might also hint towards that this data set is very simple because you can even, if you don't give it labels, it'll find out that uh, there's some dispolarity going on. No, it's, it's the, um, so the question is what is the y-axis, which I didn't label, shame on me. It's the component vector. So this is uh, the components of the eigenvector. Um, as I said with PCA, eigenvectors don't really have directions. So whether it's positive or negative is completely meaningless, uh, usually. So for the first one, everything is positive because it points from zero to the center of the data. But for the other ones, um, I mean, actually, given the... Um, now, given the math of it, it actually, that's basically, that's a random effect, it could also be all negative. It just says they all have the same coefficient because it points into the center. But um, all the rest, basically, the sign, you could flip it, that's just uh, uh, random numerics. Um, but it just says, um, I mean, you should think about this as. A vector in the space, and you can um, the things that have the same sign are sort of in the same direction, and the things that have the opposite sign are in the other direction. Um, so maybe the easiest is uh, to look at this one here. This is basically a vector that points from movie to films, and it doesn't really matter which way you point it, uh, but uh, 
that is sort of, uh, it says there is an, the, an axis that's interesting, that's the axis that uh, connects movies and films. And so um, that is an interesting direction of, var of variation. Yeah? I mean, semantic. I mean, with semantic, I mean, it has something to do with the content of the reviews. And so here, the bag of words representation is like it knows nothing about the meaning of words at all, right? The bag of words is just it does a regular expression, and then if it's the same word, you, you count. Uh, whereas here, there seems to be some concept of things being. Uh, positive and th things being negative, or like, um, like th uh, some things seem to capture, like this axis se seems to capture a movie being good versus a movie being bad. So, I mean, by semantic, this is something that's like about the content of the review that was discovered. So, does it like relating to that? If everything on one side is similar to each other, then that tells us it's a category. Or like something that is similar? Wait, I'm not sure. Like you said, we can interpret either side of the axis as being similar, right? In some yes. Manner. And if we find one side of the axis to also have um, components that are like words that have semantic meaning, so what do we learn so from that? From that, I mean, what, what do we learn um, from them having the same sign here, or for them all pointing the same, or from this component pointing? Uh, in the direction of these words. I mean, it means that this is a um, common direction of variance, that these words appear together frequently. And it, I mean, this is all, we were only working with um, how frequent a word appears. And here it says, documents commonly have these words together. And um, so, it doesn't really tell you there's a class, but it t tells you something like there's an aspect of the data that says um, if you're using these words, you're probably also using these words. And if you're using these words, you're not using these words. The reason why there's this well, everything is positive in the first component is because we didn't remove the mean. Because all the data process is shifted from the origin. We always have a bigger factor pointing to that direction. So at, le at least that is my that is my intuition of why this happens. And it happens all the time. So um, I'm not I don't use LS that much, but uh, that's my intuition is that that's just sort of captures the mean direction. <laughs> So this is a very, very simple um, approach. It's just doing an SVD. It's basically doing a PCA of the data. But we saw, at least in this relatively simple data set, we already could capture something um, that's interesting about the data set. Oh, here I also I um, fitted a model um, to see how informative are actually the first 10 components and the first 10 components together, I get 82% um, accuracy. If I use the whole bag of word representation, I, uh, we saw last time or a time before, it was around 88%. So with the, say, 30,000 dimensional representation, we get 88% accuracy, but keeping only the first 10 components, we still get 82% accuracy. Um, so, uh, we can compress the data a lot and still uh, r retain um, quite a bit of information, even though this is e feature extraction was completely unsupervised. Professor, the target for logistic regression is positive and negative for review? The, the target for logistic regression is positive review versus negative review, yes. Where it was like one, two, three, four stars is negative, five stars was dropped, and Six stars was dropped, I think, and seven, eight, nine, and ten is a uh, positive review. Cool. So, the next model I want to talk about is topic models. So, topic models are 
generally uh, more complex models that try to capture semantics of what is going on in text. And it's a broad category of models, and, but um, there's one particular model that I want to talk about, which is uh, LD, uh, LDA or, or like lyrically allocation. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about NMF, uh, applied to text data. So the idea behind um, topic models is that each document is created as a mixture of topics. And uh, each topic is a distribution over words. And so what we want to learn is uh, what are the topics and what is the composition of, our doc of uh, the documents over the topics simultaneously. So this is um, motivated by, say, news articles, where you can think about um, an article could be about like, China and economy, or about, um, I don't know, economy and internet technology. And uh, so each article in the newspaper could, has like several different topics it belongs to. And um, depending on which topics it is about, you're more likely or less likely to see certain words. And so this is sort of the, the general idea, and you now I'll talk about two ways we can solve this. So one of them, as I said, is NMF, so non-negative matrix vectorization. As a reminder, in NMF, we um, factorize our data matrix X as um, H times W, where H is a hidden representation and W is a vector of weights. And uh, we restrict H and W both to be positive, and we assume that X is positive. Here, X will be our um, back of word representation, which is positive. So we can apply this. And uh, just as a reminder for last time, um, commonly we use either the KL divergence or the log loss. And I think it's a little bit easier to think about the, sorry, or the squared loss. And I think it's a little bit easier to think about the square loss as the reconstruction. So we try to find H and W so that um, the product is similar to uh, X in the squared loss sense. Also called Frobenius uh, loss on matrices. All right, so what does this mean for NMA? for topic models. So now X is, uh, the rows in X are the documents of our corpus and the columns in X are the words because this is our back foot representation. And W will now correspond to the topics. So each row in W is a topic and each column, sorry, and each row in, um, sorry, each column in H corresponds to how active that topic is for a given data point. So here, uh, the rows in H are my, my documents, but now instead of having the word counts, um, the representation is how important is this do is uh, this topic for this document? And so I can um, look again at the components. So here now all the um, all the components are positive because it's a negative matrix factorization. So I did it once on the scale data and once on the not scale data. Um, so here I extracted 100 components. Um, they are not ordered in any way, so I tried to pick. I think I tried to pick the ones that have a uh, large ma uh, magnitude, and um, that doesn't really necessarily mean these are the most inter interesting ones. Okay. 
So, um, we can maybe. So, some of them are um, maybe some capture some semantics of the, the data, but most of them seem to mostly explain one word, which is kind of boring. Um, so, there's this component seems to be about um, musicals. Um, the other ones I find a little bit harder to understand. Um, I think if we do this without scaling, we, I got a little bit more um, semantic uh, components. The, one of them is just movie, which is interesting. This one here is about uh, DC comics, like Superman and Batman. Um, this one here seems to be like t uh, teenage uh, love movies. These here. Here are musicals again. This one here seems to be about Star Wars. So you can see that there's like very specific topics um, in these 100 components. And so for example, uh, I could now find all the Superman, Batman movies or all the Star Wars movies by looking at a particular component. So sorry, are each one of these like a different component? How, how do you get this, how do you visualize each one so of these? So this is, the visualization corresponds entirely to what I did with latent semantic analysis. So I now, I have, I created 100 components I show nine of them here, and um, so each component has some positive weight for each of the words. Excuse me. Great example. Um, so each component that I think of as a topic has like a positive entry for each word, and now I only show the most positive entries. And so um, if I look at this, it has like an entry of six for Batman, entry of four for Superman, and so on. And then uh, for all the other words, it has entries that are less than 0.5. But this is like a 30,000 dimensional vector, but I only show like the, the 10 most, uh, the highest elements. And if you reduce the number of components, then I guess the top the bag can become more broad? OK, uh, I'm going to address this question uh, uh, right. So here. Um, I have 100 components, as I said, if I reduce the number of components, these will be completely different, possibly. And we can see some of them are very specialized. Um, so I'm gonna uh, show what uh, happens if I change the number of components, but um, before I do that, um, maybe another variant is doing this uh, with TF-IDF rescaling instead of um, the, just a standard scaler. Um, and the components, some of them are similar. Um, there's, I mean, this is also, as you can see, it's a little bit like uh, tea leaf reading. And uh, depending on how you pre-process the data, you get uh, different results. So personally, um, um, this, NMF without scaling seems to be like most, most interesting to me, but um, you should actually look at all 100 components. I like used a possibly bad heuristic to figure out which ones to show here, and um, there might be more interesting components in there. So the question that I just had was, if I use less components, will they be more broad? And the answer is yes. So if I now, if I do instead uh, 10 components, um, so I showed all the components except for one, because that, that fit better on my monitor. And um, so now you can see the first one just explains uh, movie. The second one is a lot of verbs, actually, that are just about uh, watching. This one here seems to be pretty positive. It also has a 10 in it, which you might remember from uh, two times ago. Uh, the 10 just means it's ten, it got 10 of 10 st stars. Um, here, this one seems to be about um, comedies. This here seems to be about uh, being bad. And this here seems to be about like horror and zombie movies. 
So you can see you can get much, much broader categories now instead of like having one for DC Comics and one for Star Wars. So the relative magnitude within one component matters. Um, I don't think I used regularization, so you can't really compare the entries in this versus this. But because everything is positive, the, the magnitude uh, matters. So this component is really mostly about movie, and this one is mostly about film. Oh, it's kind of also, you can see that uh, people that use the word film talk about uh, cinema and festivals and the directors, whether, whether the people that uh, talk about movies don't talk about these fancy things. So, um, okay, this is NMF. Uh, I didn't run the model. We could also now see that, um, see if the components extracted here are very discriminative. Um, yeah, two of these actually look pretty discriminative in terms of the supervised task of good reviews versus bad reviews, but we can definitely can find some like things that are interesting in terms of exploratory analysis. So when you run these unsupervised algorithms, um, a little bit like with class hearing, a caveat is like you should think about why are you doing this and what do you want to discover. So here I'm looking at these components mostly to get some sense of what's happening in the data to do some exploratory analysis. And I think like, finding out that there's uh, genres of movies, like getting that from the data is interesting. And um, I probably would have expected that, but uh, for a different data set, I might not know what are these uh, topics that are in here. But here, figuring out that um, there's horror movies and there's like comedies is uh, uh, something interesting to learn from the data. Yeah. Sorry? Slide 14. Yes, the number of columns of H is the number of topics. We don't know how many topics to choose, exactly. And as you can see here, if you have. Uh, more topics, so this was with 100 topics, you get more specific ones, and if you use less topics, you get more general ones. Well, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, but if, um, if I want to learn a supervised model, I could cross-validate it. If I just want to exp have, do exploratory data analysis, um, I mean, I can't really look at 100. Maybe I can look at 100, but I can't look at 1,000. The reconstruction that you get will always be better if you choose more components. So looking at this, the more topics I pick, the better uh, I can reconstruct X. But uh, maybe I'll extract components that are not very meaningful anymore. So with these 10 components, I'm sort of, I have some idea about like, they seem to make sense to me. Uh, and uh, I can look at them and I can think about what they mean for a data set. If I have many more, it might be harder to use them for exploratory analysis. But yeah, again, with unsupervised learning, it is, uh, think about what, what do you want to get out of this? So, I think the, the rest of the lecture I want to spend on latent like, directly allocation. Uh, or as I like to say, the other LDA. We already talked about LDA, uh, which was linear discriminant analysis. And um, linear discriminant analysis, uh, I think we did two weeks ago or something like this, is linear classifier. Light Derrick allocation is an unsupervised uh, topic model. And so they have basically nothing in common, except that they're both called LDA, to the confusion of everybody. So when anyone says, oh, why don't you use LDA? Um, maybe ask them what they mean. So the idea here is exactly the same as we talked about um, NMF. So we want to get topics 
and we want to um, mo model for each document which are the prevalent topics. Here's a nice slide that uh, from Dave Fly and John Paisley that I saw. Um, so let's say here you have your collection of documents and for each uh, document you, um, you want to say what are the uh, topics that are prevalent as shown here and what are the topics overall. So um, Lake Directly Allocation has uh, a generative model associated with it that says how was the document generated and um, I briefly want to talk through, through this model. So given the topics, um, each document is assumed to be generated by first saying drawing the topic proportions, so saying um, okay, this, this document is mostly about the yellow topic, a little bit about the pink topic, not about the green topic, and a little bit about this light blue topic. This would be the, these bars. So that's uh, the first step of generating it. The second step is for each word in the document, um, you now decide which of these topics it belongs to. So basically you draw from this distribution, from this multinomial distribution, and say, um, okay, uh, I want to get a word from uh, pink, I want to get a word from yellow, I want to get a word from pink, I want to get a word from yellow, I want to get a word from uh, blue, and so on. And um, then um, once you, you know you want to get a word from pink, you look at the distribution of words in that given topic, and then you pick one of these words according to the um, to the learned probabilities of the words in the topic. So again, so um, each topic is basically a multinomial distribution over, over words. So these are all sum to one. So it says, if I wanted a word from a topic, uh, let's say the first topic is uh, genetics, then I have a probability distribution over all the words and um, if I want a word from this topic, I just pick according to this distribution. Um, here's another way to represent this model, which is using um, uh, plate notation in graphical models. This is something, okay, who here has seen this kind of plate notation before? Ooh, okay. If you haven't seen this, it's maybe a little bit tricky to understand. Um, a friend of mine said this is the worst way to, to uh, explain any model, but it's something if you talk about probabilistic models, you will see in many papers. So here each node corresponds to a random variable, and these red boxes, also called plates, corresponds to um, repetition of random variables. So here k is the number of topics. For each topic, I have a distribution over words that's called phi. So phi k is for topic k, k the distribution, the multinomial distributions of our words. Capital D is the number of documents. For each document, I have um, a multinomial distribution uh, theta over the topics. What's the distribution of the topics in this document? And N D is the number of words in the deep document. And so for each word in document, I have a variable um, z, that is, which topic does this word belong to? And then I have the word indicator, which says, what is the actual word? So if I want to create a document, then the first thing that I draw is a distribution over topics. Um, then for each word that I want to create, I create I pick which topic I want, and then pick, uh, using uh, the topic and the distribution over words in that topic, I pick a word. And now what we want to do is we basically want to invert this process and we want to figure out um, what is the distribution of words uh, for each of the topics? So what are the topics in our data set? 
And for each document, what are the distributions um, over topics in this document? There's two things that I haven't talked about, uh, which are alpha and beta. And so these are um, the priors over the topic distributions and over the uh, topic word distributions. And um, what, what this means is, um, so for each topic, I have a distribution over words. And like, if I want to create a new topic, I need to say, what distribution do I want to draw this from if I want to write down a generative model? And um, here what it says is, I draw it from the Dirichlet distribution. And I'll talk about the Dirichlet distribution in a little bit. Well, in the next slide. So basically, these alpha and beta tell you, if I want to create a new topic, what is my prior assumption about what topics look like? And the alpha is, if I want to create a new document, what's my prior assumption about how topics are distributed within a given document? So there's two types of distributions. There's the directly distributions, alpha and beta, and then all the other distributions are uh, multinomial distributions. And so, let quick refresher on multinomial distributions. A multinomial distribution models the probability of counts for rolling a k-sided die n times. Here, in our context, um, I mean, there's multiple multinomial distributions, but let's say we look at the multinomial distribution that are the topics. So each topic is a multinomial distribution over words. And so let's say I want to, um, so the k side, the die is k, here it's a different k, is um, the number, of, would be the number of words. And so I roll my very big die with like 100,000 dimensions and then um, it lands on one of the words. And so n here would be the length of, uh, or the number of words from the topic that I want. So, uh, a t so this multinomial associated with the topic, it says, if I get n words from this topic, this is the distribution of words that I will see. Sorry, this is the count of, counts of words that I will see. So this is a distribution you could think of this as over word counts. Uh, but this is also used in like in the in the other th in the other places. Um, where you want for each document figure out um, how often a word appears uh, in a given topic. All right, so now we also have this directly distribution. The directly distribution is um, the what's called the conjugate prior uh, for the multinomial. So if you look at this uh, multinomial distribution, which you're hopefully somewhat familiar with, um, we have the probability of observing the counts x1 to xk. So this is how often we, write, we arrive if on the k side given that I roll the die n times and the, the, the weights of the sides. The directly distribution is um, like the formula looks very similar. It's like, it's, but instead of having uh, p to the xi, you now have a, a distribution where the xi are the base and the parameters are uh, the exponents. And so this basically says, if I observed that I had alpha one many, so my die landed alpha one many times on the first side and alpha k many times on the k side, what is, uh, what is the probability distribution over the piece? So what do I assume the, pro the probability distribution was given the observations? So this basically turns around the process. Um, 
And in general, um, conjugate prior is um, a prior that, so that the posterior has the same form as the prior. So if you do, like, if you basically, if you want to apply base formula, that um, the result of applying base formula looks nice again. So here, if you um, multiply a multinomial distribution by a Dirichlet distribution, the result will look like a multinomial distribution again. So basically, we're using the Dirichlet prior because it makes the math look nice. This is generally in graphical models or in uh, Bayesian modeling, why you use conjugate priors is because they make the models uh, look nicer and simpler. Um, so the Dirichlet distribution um, is a distribution over probability distributions. So it's a distribution over the probabilities I expect to be um, assigned to the sides k of my die. And uh, so this is a distribution over the simplex, um, meaning over all the vectors of length k that sum to one. Here, this is picture. This is from a picture from Wikipedia showing um, this in uh, for three probabilities. So in two di two dimensions. Um, so let's say there's like k would be three. So we have this. The corners here correspond to the probability of uh, the case side being one and probability of the other ones being zero. Um, and so here's different examples of a Dirichlet distribution over this triangle. And um, basically, this, 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 uh, the first one is a very broad uh, distribution which says, oh, I don't actually know what the distribution is going to be. Whereas these are a little bit more peaked. This one basically says, oh, I know the, the distribution is basically one third, one third, one third. Uh, it's like in the center. Like all of the three uh, corners are equally likely. Um, they could also be skewed to one of the sides saying, oh, I think uh, this, this corner is very unlikely, but uh, distributions around here are very likely. So let's say um, it's something like, uh, what is it? Point four point or uh, point four point six zero or something like this. All right. So and having these distributions, we can then assemble this wonderful graphical model. Um, oh, I'll not ask any of these equations in any exam, by the way. Um, I'm just trying to give you sort of an understanding of how, how these models, uh, like what the math is behind the models. And the math is, as you might see, actually quite tricky. Oh, um, what I did mention, this model is like very, very widely used now. Uh, it's actually uh, was uh, created by um, Prof Professor uh, Dave Bly, who's uh, here at Stats Institute. So he's like one of the most famous people we have here because he invented this model. Um, well, and he, he did lots of other things too, but he's mostly famous for creating this model. Um, okay, so now let's say we kind of understand what the generative process of this model is, and so now we have our beautiful IMDB data set and we want to fit this model. What are we going to do? There's generally two um, schools of solvers. There's Gibbs sampling and variational inference. Um, Gibbs sampling is uh, a Markov chain Monte Carlo procedure uh, which you can use on any probabilistic model. It's very accurate and very slow. So you get very good results if you wait a very long time. Variational inference is uh, an extension of the expectation maximization algorithm that we saw for um, Gaussian mixture models where you basically alternate between computing the means and uh, the cluster or the component assignments. Um, Variational inference is faster, but usually provides solutions that are less accurate. And this is what David Bly's group has been working on um, for many years. 
So generally, so given this trade-off, Usually you want to use GIP sampling if you have a smaller data set and you want to use variational inference if you have a bigger data set. Because if you have a big data set, then GIP sampling will never finish. Uh, GIP sampling is a randomized procedure. So another way is to use variational inference to get some initialization and then run GIP sampling from there on to get like, it's like fine tuning basically. So if you have small data, I would suggest using GIP sampling. There is no GIP sampling in scikit-learn, but there's a package called LDA, and there's a very high quality implementation in Java called Mallet, uh, done by Hannah Wallach, who's also in New York, but at Microsoft. Um, well, it, not, not everything is done by her, but she did some very cool stuff in there. Um, for medium data, you would use variational inference, uh, which is the default in scikit-learn, so this will be faster, but maybe give you less accurate results. If you have very large data sets, um, you might want to work with stochastic variational inference, um, which also allows you uh, to do online learning or learning on a stream. So this is if you have like really large data sets, it's sort of an even more approximate version of variational inference, but it's going to be even faster on big data sets. Um, so the Variational inference and stochastic variational inference are both implemented in scikit-learn. Um, but you can also use um, what was used, what used to be called Edward is now called TensorFlow probability. Um, that's basically a whole framework for doing probabilistic uh, modeling based on TensorFlow with variational inference and um, or stochastic variational inference. So if you have a GPU or if you have a lot of data. Um, maybe use the implementation in TensorFlow probability, not the implementation in scikit-learn. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's actually quite hard to implement this variational inference correctly, and uh, TensorFlow has the benefit of being able to compute the derivatives automatically, while in scikit-learn we have to compute all the derivatives by hand, and it's not a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's no fun at all, actually. Um, so doing, doing TensorFlow probability makes things much, much nicer. Oh, D Dustin was a PhD student of Dave Bly, so, or still is a deep, uh, and he's now at Google. Google hired him because he did Edward, and now it's in TensorFlow. Okay, the result of this fancy probabilistic model is very similar to the result, like in, in nature to the result we got from NMF. So now the components here are, so I think this is, this is in log space now, but the components are these multinomial distributions. So here each component corresponds to a topic and each topic has a distribution over words. And yeah, so this is in log space, which is why these numbers are so big, or it's unnormalized. Um, so you can see here, this is very generic movie, movies, watch, and so on. Um, let's see. Here, this seems to be about uh, TV uh, episodes and series. Um, This here seems to be about like World War II. All right. Um, it's interesting because even though um, I specified 10 components, like okay, some of these components are like very specific and some of these components are like very general. So, so this one is like, very, seems very specific to like World War II and uh, this one here seems very general and we get both of these. If you get, um, if you use more components, I mean, so, but on the other hand, I didn't like plot the long tail here, so this might also be more general in the less likely words. You see, here you can see this is like character movies, maybe, about families. Um, here is the same uh, model with 100 components. So here now we would expect 
more uh, specialized components. Again, here in LDA, they are not ordered in any way. There's just, you just have 100 components and um, changing number of components will give you completely different components. Well, here you can, this one is clearly about uh, some comedies. Um, I don't know if it's helpful. I'm not entirely sure if I can interpret any of the other ones. Um, here's a couple more of them. Um, maybe in a way that's easier to, to show. Oh, here now I'm um, giving you the number of the topic and then these are the most common words uh, ranked. And so here, topic four we saw already, that's like comedy, uh, the 57 is about TV. This, this one here is about horror movies, which all have one Halloween. This one's clearly martial arts. Um, musicals, and so on. Um, again, we could um, use now the um, distribution over topics for each of the documents as a latent representation and run a classifier on it if we wanted to. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, basically here, again, I just want to do exploratory data analysis and see what are the kind of topics that the model discovers. Um, there's a couple of hyperparameters. Um, in, in particular, the most important type of the parameters, I think, are the docu doc topic prior, which is called either alpha or theta in the literature, and the topic word prior, which is called either beta or eta in the literature. So these are the two guys here. These are the literary distributions that I talked about. And uh, basically, a larger value means we have this more dispersed, flatter thing which means um, you have a flatter distribution over words, so the topics are less specialized, and a smaller volume means it's more concentrated, meaning, wait, actually no. It's the prior is more, it's broader, a more broad prior means actually more specialized topics, sorry. A broader prior means you have some mass in the corners, so you're, able to have like be very specialized whereas if you're very peaked and you're very in the center and you are not allowed to be as specialized yeah so I find it kind of hard to tune these parameters mallet has um, some good heuristics for tuning these parameters so if you have a, in particular if you have a smaller data set and you want to use MCMC uh, use the Java implementation in mallet they have like also a command line interface or something like this and so um, maybe it's worth trying that. Um. All right, so I didn't want to go into how to implement um, the stochastic variational inference because it's uh, quite, quite complicated. But I thought uh, I'll take the time to talk about uh, MCMC uh, a little bit. Okay, can I repeat what I said? Okay, so I was talking basically about the beta. So beta is the prior over topic distributions over words. So if um, beta is large, it means I, I'm more dispersed. So if you think of this triangle, it means I'm like I have mass everywhere. And so um, like a, a corner would correspond to all the probability being on a single word. And so if I have mass everywhere, I'm allowed to stay in a corner. It's unlikely I'm in a corner, but I'm like, I can be in a corner, it's, it's basically possible. Uh, we, and that being in a corner means being very specialized because I would have all my probability on one of the words. Um, or, and being on a boundary would be like, um, yeah, well, being in the center means you have um, a uniform probability for all the words, which means you're very general. Uh, okay, but then in that case, uh, so, so you need to know the magnitude of alpha, and also you need to know, so going back to that lab, if you have a lot of alpha, you have a widespread uh, distribution, right? But then if you have a constant with alpha, you also need to know where that factor lies on to know to say whether the topic is specific or general, right? What if you Oh, 
So, okay, the question is a little bit, um, I think, if, if you're specific, you also would need, like, if you're peaked, you need to know where you are, right, in the space. So these are the priors. Um, you then observe data, and then you compute the posterior, which means, uh, and that gives you the location of where each topic are. Like, at the beginning, you don't know about any topics, but then once you assign, um, to each word you assign a topic, or you soft assign a topic, depending on which, which algorithm you do, and uh, given that you that then you know, oh, this is the distribution over words that I have um, observed in my data, and this will, um, sorry, uh, and this will give you the, dis the distribution phi. So the distribution phi you'll get out is the posterior over um, so the, having the prior beta and then observing the word counts. Um, but so, basically the prior just gives you, um, sort of restricts somewhat where you're allowed to go in that space or where you put weight in that space. And then uh, the posterior gives you where you actually are. Okay, yeah, as I said, so, or, any, any more questions about the model? I know it's like, it's a little bit complicated. Um, otherwise, I'll talk briefly about MCMC and Gibbs sampling, which are te um, techniques that are generally pretty useful if you do any probabilistic modeling. So we haven't really talked that much about this kind of optimization techniques, but I thought, uh, given that I have like 10 more minutes to talk about Topic models, I'll talk about um, how to do MCMC in Gibbs sampling. So MCMC, as I said, sends for Markov chain Monte Carlo. The goal here is to sample from a complex probability distribution. In um, or, or get the expectation over a distribution. Maybe I should have said that. Either sample from and or get the expectation. Well, you can get the expectation by running many, many samples. What we want to compute in this model here is uh, the phi's and the thetas, right? We want to know what is the distribution for each topic over the words, and for each document, we want to know what are the topics. These are the, the things that we want to compute in the end. Um, and so if we could sample from this model, we could sample a whole bunch of time, then we could look at what are these on average. So Markov chain Monte Carlo is a combination of two ideas, uh, Markov chains and Monte Carlo algorithms. Uh, Monte Carlo algorithms are things that are correct in expectation or correct on average. They work via sampling, so you sample from a distribution, and uh, if you sample often enough, uh, if you can, like, law uh, of large numbers tells you you can, um, you, you get the correct mean. Um, a Markov chain is a sequence of probability distribution where each distribution only depends on the previous state. And so, um, Markov chains are sort of the easiest way to model uh, time series or any series data where you say, um, the, the next state only depends on the previous state and not on like two states ago. All the information about the past is contained in the previous state. And so what is this combination now? Markov chain Monte Carlo is a sequence of probability distributions so that on average you sample from the target distribution. So we want to sample from this guy P, but P is really complicated and hard to sample from. So now we're going to um, construct a chain of distributions that on average approximates P. Um, a little bit more formally, we create a Markov chain. Wow, I misspelled Markov. That's really bad. Um, a mar this um, we create a Markov chain so that the stationary distribution of the Markov chain is the target distribution. And then it also misspelled distribution. Wow. Um, P. Um, 
So basically, we will, uh, we will create this Markov chain, we'll draw samples, and we'll draw samples, and if we wait long enough, the samples that we get will be from our actual distribution P that it was very hard to sample from. And there's many ways to create these Markov chains, and um, a very simple one that you can basically always use is called Gibbs sampling. And uh, maybe if I show you how Gibbs sampling works, this whole thing becomes a little bit more clear. So, um, the goal, okay, you can nearly always use Gibbs sampling. So the goal is to sample from this complex distribution, and we make the assumption now that we can sample from the conditional distributions. So given, like we want to, we have a distribution over like a vector, which is like everything in this model, like all the document probabilities and all the um, topic, do all the topic probabilities, all the uh, document topic assignments, and so on. And we assume that um, we can sample the conditional um, of one of these variables dependent on all, uh, conditioned on all the other variables. That's true for most models, particularly because we um, pick the uh, conjugate prior. Each individual variable in this thing is either going to be uh, directly distributed or multinomially distributed. And we can easily draw from multinomial distributions. OK, so in particular, if you, con uh, if you uh, construct any complex model, if you use these conjugate priors, you can always sample from the conditional distributions uh, of, for a single variable given all the other variables. So now we start from some random initialization. We give some initial values to each of uh, each entry of our, um, of our vector that we want to sample. And now we create this uh, this Markov chain, which is a chain of um, distributions that we sample from. So, did I? Oh yeah. So let's say I have x k, which is the k step. So let's say we have the zero step, and I want to uh, construct x one. So the next step. So for the first entry, what I do is. Oh, sorry, this should have been a zero here. Um, I just draw x zero for the k plus one step as a probability of uh, x zero given all the x one to x n from the previous step. So basically, I use all my initial values here for everything but the first variable. And for the first variable, I draw from the conditional. And then for the second entry and so on, for all the other entries, um, I start uh, for the first entries that are for smaller than i, I use the ones for the k plus 1 step that I already sampled. And for the other ones that are larger than i, I use the one from the, large, from the last step. So So let's say I have, um, oh, where's the x1, 0. So this is now the variables. I have three variables. This is the zero step. And now I want to sample for the first step. The first thing is a sample x1, 1, according to p of x1, given x2. From the zero step, three from the zero step, and then I uh, sample x two from step one according to p from x two using x one uh, x x one from the first step and x3 from the zero step, and then a sample x3 for the first step, by going to p of x3, given x1 from the first step, and x2 from the first step. Something like this. So 
and now let's see if I can type this. Now I have the uh, all the variables for step number one. And then I can do the same thing again. And now I can do uh, all the variables from for step number two and so on. So entry by entry, I sample each comp uh, each variable given all the other variables in the current stage. It's like pr it's pretty simple. It's just very hard to write down. And if you do this, then uh, the math is pretty, and everything works out. And the stationary distribution of this is uh, p of oh my gosh, why is my battery empty? Um, great. Um, and the stationary distribution of this is. Um, the, the joint distribution P. So we assumed that we can only uh, sample these conditionals, and, but if we iterate this uh, procedure long enough, we actually get a sample from the joint distribution. Question? Okay, I think I... I confused myself because I started the axis at one here and at zero here. Th this should be a zero, and then everything's fine. Yeah. Here? No. That is you. Th th that is sort of the the trick because you don't have them from the case set. So you start at the beginning, like so here, I started updating this guy using these from the previous step. Then I updated this guy using, this I already updated, so I used a new one, and here I used the old one. And then for this one, I used both of the new ones. Like, I, I can't, if, I, if I sample this, I can't use this, the new version of this guy because I haven't computed it yet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it always de depends on the one step before, not any of the previous steps. Yes. Like it implicitly depends on your initial condition because, like, uh, where you end up depends on where you start. And so you start. Usually, you do this uh, many. Like you run this chain many times from different random initializations, and then you get many samples from the distribution that you're interested in. And then you can compute uh, like the average or something like this, and then this gives you the, or yeah, you, you can compute anything from these samples that um, will then tell you what are your topics. Okay, the question is, how do you know how many uh, steps to run, and? Uh, I'm actually not an expert on this at all, but uh, there is some heuristics, but it's kind of hard. And so people struggle with this in practice. Um, so basically there's like, uh, you want to know how often do I have, to, or how many steps do I have to run? So it's independent of what my initialization and actually samples from the distribution. And uh, th that's called, uh, yeah. And in a sense, you can never actually be sure that happens. And, um, but usually people are like, I don't know, depending on how complex the problem is, 100 steps or 1,000 steps or something like this. Um, <laughs> and, but it's, and there's like, there's uh, debugging statistics that tell you uh, how, well, did that happen or um, are you sampling from the right distribution? But it's all a little bit like uh, tricky. Okay, the question is, so you try an arbitrary number of steps and an arbitrary number of different initializations, uh, and ye yes, and the bigger both of these numbers, the better your approximation will be. And uh, you're only guaranteed that if you do infinite of both, then you, ha you have a good... <laughs> um, and so that, that, this is why this is very slow, because it's, you don't, and you don't know, it's, you need to run it usually for a long time, and you don't really know when to stop. Um, 
But for the, the other thing, the variational distribution, basically there's, not, there's, a, there's no guarantee that it's going to converge to the exact thing. It's basically guaranteed to not converge to the right solution. So, and also the math is way more complicated than this. Okay. Um, so how would we apply this to this now? Um, oh, time's up. Just very briefly, um, you can write this down. And basically what we want, we are sampling three things. This variable, the topic, we want to vary, um, sample the topics given the document um, topic distributions and the topic word distributions. And it's this guy where these are like the uh, word counts per topic and the topic count. No, sorry, this is the word counts per topic and this is how often um, the document... Wait, this is the word counts per topic and this is the, oh, the topic counts per document. And, okay, you, you can count these and um, uh, then you sample these guys and these guys, and these are also basically just counts of how often a word is in a document or how often a word was assigned to a topic. Um, yeah. If you, there's here, um, there's two, two papers if you are more interested in this, uh, Rethinking LDA Why Empires Matter by Hannah Wallach. Um, about, this is, a little bit about uh, hyperparameter tuning and then LDA revisited entropy prior and convergence. Um, and both of them discuss uh, how hard it is to fit these models in practice. Um, maybe the main, one of the main takeaways is that, I mean, there's two takeaways. A, these models are quite hard to fit, the LDA model in particular. Um, and so, um, th really think about what is your goal. There's, I've done capstone projects where the outcome was we fit an LEA model, and then you have like this, uh, then you have a topic model. But wh what are you going to do with this? How are you? How is this relevant to your product, to your analysis, to whatever you're doing? So this is, can be helpful for exploratory data analysis, but it's never going to be really like a product. It's never going to. Your outcome shouldn't be a topic model. I would argue. If your outcome is a topic model, what are you going to do with it? Um, but it's still a very interesting technique and you're definitely going to come across it in your career again. So I hope you have some idea of how these work now. Oh, and I'm going to publish the homework later today.